Stephanie June, your wonderful, wonderful friend and colleague from the Center for Security Policy. Thank you. Very, very pleased to be here and appreciative of uh, all the work that Sarah does and that has gone into putting this conference together as well as um, helping to advance the sorts of ideas that we're all seized with here. Um, I've been asked to talk about a topic that is actually bigger than Saudi Arabia, uh, but they're very much involved in it. Uh, it is something actually that uh, the Saudis came to rather late in the game, uh, as opposed to uh, the Iranians, uh, Dubai, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, um, and other states that to varying degrees um, embrace and adhere to uh, the program that authoritative Islam, and I emphasize that authoritative Islam calls Sharia. I I'm sure everyone here appreciates what that is. It is uh, essentially a comprehensive, well, literally, path to God in accordance with which its adherents are told how to govern absolutely every aspect of life, from how one prays, which direction, how often, what you say, what you don't say, to what you eat and don't eat, to how you conduct your affairs, personal, business, and so on, all the way up to how the world is governed. That is Sharia, and sadly, it is not simply the program of a relatively small number of folks, some of whom seem to be inhabiting caves in uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan or both, and their like-minded jihadists elsewhere. This is a program that the authorities of Islam believe must be followed by all who are faithful to Islam, and by the way, that must be either embraced in the form of conversion or must be submitted to by everybody else. The third alternative under Sharia, besides conversion and submission, is death. Now imagine for a moment, Jim introduced a, an era that we both uh, struggled through, as did our country. But imagine if during the Cold War, the Soviet Union not only managed to recruit into its influence operations, a relatively small number of very prominent capitalists like Occidental Petroleum's Armand Hammer and Archer Daniels Midland's Dwayne Andreas and PepsiCo's Donald Kendall, but actually were able to insinuate into the senior reaches of literally every Western financial institution, agents of the KGB. And not just get them in place, mind you, but have them installed in positions that would enable those agents to exercise considerable discretion and influence over the flows from those institutions of capital and credit. Now I suggest to you that there is simply no chance that what Churchill famously called the long twilight struggle with communism Cold War, Ronald Reagan called the evil empire, the Soviet Union, would have come out as it did. Had that kind of arrangement, that kind of 
penetration and influence over at least a very substantial portion of the world's economic flows, say a trillion dollars in today's currency. Especially if money could have been denied, capital and credit, been denied to Western defense industries as a result of the KGB's direction. Now, I'm afraid I have to tell you that I believe that is exactly what is happening today in what I call the war for the free world. Thanks to what has come to be known as Sharia compliant finance, it sometimes goes by other euphemisms, Islamic finance, uh, particularly in the wake of the meltdown of much of the capitalist system, uh, they've coined this term ethical finance. But I think within the industry itself, because it is about Sharia, they prefer to call it Sharia compliant finance. Today we have agents of Sharia in place in virtually every one of the major financial institutions, banks, uh, other lending institutions, investment houses, who are as committed to our destruction and the establishment, the dominance of their agenda as ever were the KGB. So what is Sharia compliant finance? Well, if you ask those in the West who are engaged in these sorts of transactions, what you'll typically find is they will tell you it is, you know, financial arrangements that are consistent with Islamic religious practice. And typically that means, they say, that you cannot charge or incur interest. You cannot invest in activities that involve haram endeavors, pork, gambling, tobacco, alcohol, pornography, entertainment more generally perhaps, and Western defense. Not Muslim defense, mind you. So defense isn't the issue, it's our defense is haram. Now, if you ask those who are the prime movers behind this program, what is Sharia compliant finance, you get a somewhat different rendering. For example, perhaps the most prominent of these individuals, a chap by the name of Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi. Perhaps you see him on his regular weekly spot on Al Jazeera, where he foment, foments hatred against the West and calls for the death of Americans, both military personnel in places like Iraq and those infidels more generally. Done a couple of fatwas, has old Karadawi against, among other people, Wafa Sultan, who Ali and the rest of us I sure know well as a woman who has dared to stand up to some of this Sharia business. Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi has called Sharia compliant finance financial jihad. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Then there's a Mufti Muhammad Taki Usmani, another of the sort of go-to guys in this industry. In fact, we published uh, last year 
a book which if, if you'd like copies of it, you can see me after or go to uh, our website, securefreedom.org. It's called Sharia Law and Financial Jihad. How should America respond? The McCormick Foundation and the Center for Security Policy published it together. Sheikh Taki Usmani is listed here. This may be a little out of date, but I don't think so. As either the chairman, in most cases, or the member of something on the order of 14 of the world's preeminent Sharia compliant banking uh, institutions. What does Taki Usmani call Sharia compliant finance? Jihad with money. Again, could they be more clear about what they have in mind? The truth of the matter is that Sharia compliant finance is whatever guys like Karadawi and Usmani say it is. They can render a judgment in their capacity as the Sharia advisors who have to be engaged by these financial institutions in order to have Sharia compliant programs such that something that might appear to some individuals to be haram, impure, is actually deemed halal, pure. There was actually a, a famous episode that caused a considerable perturbation in the financial force a while back when a bunch of these Sharia advisors had come up with a, an approved sukuk, a bond, claiming that it was configured in such a way as to be halal, pure, and old Sheikh Taki Usmani came up on the net and said, it's not. The thing kind of melted down. There was a huge problem because at the end of the day, it's just up to these guys. In fact, I had a conversation offline privately about a week or so ago with a senior guy who professed to have been quite experienced, Western capitalist, in doing Sharia compliant transactions. And I made remarks like this at a, in a group setting and he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, it's really just a scam. It's all about interest. Of course it's about interest. It has to be. You're talking about money. There has to be return on investment, right? So how do you conceal that? Well, you get these Sharia advisors working with some of the best minds in Western capitalism, and you configure workarounds, uh, payment plans or ownership arrangements that suffice for the purposes of the Karadawis and the Usmanis and their friends to make it, if I may use that term kosher, when it isn't. Why? Why do they do this? Well, they've got several reasons. They are seeking to penetrate and influence Western societies, just as in that hypothetical situation I talked about, the KGB agents would be interested in doing. Beyond that, they're interested in legitimating Sharia. They are now recruiting actively people who are promoting Sharia, not just as a Sharia-compliant finance product, but as a, an end in itself. I'll come back to that in a minute because it's very relevant to where we are at the moment. They're interested in, not least, financial jihad, using financial leverage to advance their program and purposes. Compelling, concessions of other kinds to be made, and inducing, more generally, submission. And the more they're inside the bloodstream of what's left of our capitalist economic system, the easier it is to exercise that kind of compulsory submission, demanded at least. And not least, ladies and gentlemen, as the term jihad with money suggests, it's about making money to pay for jihad, the violent kind of jihad. This is the stealth kind. As 
Robert Spencer calls it. But to pay for the violent kind with the stealth kind. How do they do that? Well, there are two specific ways in which this is done. One is through zakat. This is a term you may have been introduced to by the president's remarks in Cairo, where he committed his administration to preventing the interference with the practice of zakat, tithing, by Muslims. Now that was a little creepy, I have to tell you, because the reason there have been impediments to zakat is four of the eight grounds under Sharia for making tithing, that is to say, that make it a creditable form of tithing, are either directly or indirectly involved in jihad of the violent kind. For example, jihad itself or martyrdom operations, or subventions for the families of martyrs. So that's kind of been a problem, and people have been prosecuted in this country for doing it. And that seems to be the kind of thing the president has in mind not having happen anymore. Well, Sharia-compliant finance will facilitate that because some of these institutions are now making it possible for you not to have to fool with deciding what to do with your money, they'll do it for you. And when you've got the Sheikh Usmanis or Mufti Usmanis and Sheikh Qaradawis of the world helping you with your zakat, that's not good. But then there's the problem, I, I alluded to it a moment ago with Usmani saying no, that Sukuk was not in fact halal. Well, when that happens, when they make a mistake, these Sharia advisors, they can fix it by a practice known as purification. What happens in purification? They decide to give money that was made haram, inadvertently, to charity. And again, for all these Sharia guys, they're Sharia advisors because they embrace Sharia, that program that is about our destruction. Their charities are not the Red Cross and the United Way. And that brings us back to the problem with the president saying he's not going to interfere with what has been in the past, at least, in some instances, material support for terror. Okay, so let me just close up here, but I have to tell you that part of why this is so troubling is that we are now in a world in which others have completely drunk the Kool-Aid on Sharia compliant finance. Notably, Prime Minister Gordon Brown of the United Kingdom has said he's determined to ensure that Britain, that London, the city, is the Sharia finance capital of the world. The famous statement by the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury to the effect that we all have to get used to Sharia was preceded by a little remarked comment to the effect that we've already accommodated ourselves to Sharia compliant finance. Therefore, we have to get used to and embrace Sharia. All right, now what's happening here? Partly because of the competitive instincts of these financial capitals and the governments involved, partly because of the desperate state of our economy, most especially after you know, the meltdown of last year, the United States government has begun actively enabling the realization of the goals of those who promote Sharia compliant finance. How do they do that? They do it by ignoring warnings, such as those of us have been sounding for some time. They have been very insistent in mischaracterizing Sharia. Not only not wanting to know what it is, but actually misrepresenting it. Surely it can't be what I've just called it. A comprehensive totalitarian program for the absolute destruction 
of Western and other non-Muslim societies subordinating all to a caliphate, a global theocracy. That, that's, that's not what they think Sharia is. Steve Coughlin, a remarkable man who was basically run out of the Pentagon where he was the duty expert from the Joint Chiefs of Staff on all of this Islamist business. Run, interestingly enough, run out because he confronted a guy who was then working for the Deputy Secretary of Defense and who insisted on doing all of the Pentagon's Muslim outreach through a Muslim Brotherhood Front organization, the Islamic Society of North America. Anyway, Steve Coughlin has done more thorough, more effective analysis and research in this than anybody else I know, specifically with respect to the question of do US government officials have a professional obligation, a duty, to know about this threat. And indeed, I think they do. So beyond ignoring the warnings and mischaracterizing Sharia, they've actually gone further and are actively encouraging the expansion of Sharia compliant finance in the United States. Let me give you just one example. In November of last year, in the Treasury Department's headquarters, there was a meeting convened for the policy community. It was called Islamic Finance, remember that's the other euphemism, Islamic Finance 101, taught by two professors at the Saudi-financed Harvard University Islamic Finance Program. But get this. The 60 or so people from all over the government were convened to get this Saudi underwritten pedagogy about the virtues of ethical finance, Sharia compliant finance, by a fellow you may or may not have ever heard of, an assistant secretary at the time by the name of Neil Kashkari. If you've heard of him, it was because at the time, he may still be there for all I know, but at the time, he was running a program you have heard of called the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP. A $700 billion dangle for our banks and other financial institutions. Access to it at the time in particular may have meant the survival or the demise of some of those institutions. Now what kind of signal do you think it sends to the financial sector, not just the policy weenies who were there, the financial sector writ large, that the guy controlling the spigot on $700 billion worth of life support wants you to know about Sharia compliant finance? I submit to you, very few people had to be told twice that the US government thinks this is a good thing. Okay, now let me conclude, I promise. The good news that we have, and there's not a lot of it, I have to tell you, but the good news that we have is that two very important legal actions have been underway here that are directly relevant to this whole business of Sharia compliant finance. I'm proud to say that one of my friends and colleagues, uh, in fact, the general counsel of the Center for Security Policy, Policy, a guy by the name of David Yerushalmi, has been instrumental in both cases. Uh, David, by the way, another must read, has published in the Utah Law Review uh, last fall, I believe, um, a terrific piece giving you everything that I've just told you and a much more about Sharia compliant finance. David brought an amicus brief on behalf of the center in a case before the Seventh Circuit Appeals Court known as Boehm versus Holy Land. Holy Land, of course, is one of those charities that is on the halal list where the Red Cross and so on are not. Holy Land was 
um, sued by the family of a young man who was murdered by Hamas in Israel, David Boyd. And for years, this thing went through the courts. Um, a lower court actually found $150 million penalty against the Holy Land Foundation. They appealed on the, on the theory that the Holy Land Foundation was doing material support through zakat for terrorism that resulted in this young man being killed. A three-judge panel of the Seventh Circuit found that unless you could actually prove that the dollar given to the Holy Land Foundation wound up in the pocket of the guy who blew up David Boyne, you got no case. What David Yerushalmi did with this amicus brief was to make the argument persuasively that if the purpose of the contribution was in furtherance of Sharia, since Sharia requires jihad of both kinds, violent and nonviolent, you do not actually have to prove that the guy who pulled the trigger or blew up the bomb got the money himself. It is enough that the person giving that money was part of the criminal enterprise. That was the finding of the full on bank Seventh Circuit in a tremendously important ruling. Jim is a preeminent attorney, will understand that better than most of us, but that creates the premise that from now on you give money to these organizations, not that are absolutely clinically identified as terrorist sponsoring cells, but that are promoting Sharia, and you've got standing. Now, taking in part that as part of the predicate, David Yershalmi, together with the Thomas Moore Law Center, has brought suit on behalf of a, an Iraq War veteran by the name of Kevin Murray in the Federal District Court in Michigan, Eastern Michigan, against a company you may have heard of, a TARP business. Well, a fair amount of it wound up in a company called AIG. And thanks to Neil Kashkari and Henry Paulson and all those guys, we now own AIG, 80% of it. But there's a problem, speaking of Sharia compliant finance, because AIG is one of the prime movers behind a product line called Sharia compliant insurance. Essentially the same thing. And I mentioned a moment ago that there's this problem that people are not only promoting Sharia compliant finance, or in this case insurance, they're promoting Sharia. If you look at AIG's website today, you will find they're actively promoting Sharia. The company we own is promoting a religion, albeit, you know, a totalitarian political program of the religion, but nonetheless, what the authorities of the religion say is the religion. Now, what that sets up, those of you in the legal business will appreciate, is a violation of the Establishment Clause of the Constitution of the United States. You cannot have the government, under the Constitution, separation of church and state, involved in promoting religions. As a result of what I think is the clarity of the violation here, the federal judge who is hearing the case has rejected the motion the government has made predictably to dismiss the case, has rejected the motion the government predictably made to greatly, severely limit the kind of discovery that could be done in this case, and in fact has called for an accelerated discovery and bringing this trial before him in November of next year, which seems like a long time, but it's gonna take David Yerushalmi a while to find out where all the bodies are buried. But I bet you anything, by the time he's done with his partners at Thomas More, 
we're going to know a lot, a lot more than we do currently about the extent to which the U.S. government is complicit in promoting Sharia and the extent to which we are now confronting here in America, not just in Britain, not just in Europe more generally, not just in the Middle East or elsewhere, here in America, jihad with money, a seditious program aimed at the destruction of our government with what is known as misprision of treason, a felony offense involving the failure when you know seditious activity is afoot to do anything about it. So stay tuned. Thank you very much for bearing with me.